Okay. Today is uh, December 18th, 2001. We're interviewing Mr. Charles B. Eames at Latham headquarters. Michael Akey, interviewer. Wayne Clark, uh, videographer. Uh, Mr. Eames, where were you born? I was born in Oneida, New York. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. You grew up in Oneida? I grew up uh, near Oneida on a dairy farm, 200 acre dairy farm. Oh. Attended Oneida schools. Mm hmm. Yeah. So you graduated from high school in Oneida? Graduated from Oneida High School. What year did you graduate? I graduated in 1938. 1938. Yes. What was it like in Oneida in 1938? It's very pleasant. I, um, I have I have no uh, no bad memories of Oneida. Mm -hmm. Saturday night was always a, a big night when people came to town to shop. Mm -hmm. It was a nice nice small community. Now, um, after you graduated, what did you do? You work on the farm? I uh, attended Hamilton College for four years. Oh, very good. Clayton. Working on the farm in the summertime, of course. And uh, yes, Hamilton College in Clinton, New York. That's where my mother's from. Good. Mm -hmm. That's another nice little town. Mm -hmm. And um, so you were attending college when World War II broke out? Yes. Do you remember where you were when Pearl Harbor was... Uh, Actually, out? I was home for a weekend and uh, seeing a movie, uh, an afternoon movie at the uh, Callet Theater in Oneida. Hmm. And the movie was uh, Gene Autry and Sierra Sue. As I recall, <laughs> and I, I learned when I got home from the movie that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. Now, what uh, remember what your feelings were at that point? Well, my feelings at that time were, uh, I, I guess, not. Uh, I really, I did, really didn't have a uh, an early impact of. Uh, what it was all about. And, right. and I didn't know where Pearl Harbor was. Mm -hmm. I knew I uh, knew it was uh, it was not good news, but I didn't ri realize how uh, dramatic uh, right. the event was until I got back to Hamilton College that evening, and of course everyone was in an uproar about mm -hmm. it too. Yeah. Now you're able to finish your. Uh uh, yeah, yes, I finished my <coughs> senior year at Hamilton and uh, enlisted in the aviation cadets uh, soon thereafter. Why did you pick uh, the aviation cadets? <clears throat> well, I was interested in uh, uh, the Air Corps, I suppose, uh, largely because I had taken um, the uh, well, at the time was called the CPT program, the Civilian Pilot Training Program. Okay. And I learned to fly a Piper Cub first in that, oh. and, then, and then in the uh, second phase of that program, I had flown the uh, Waco F-7 biplane, which mm -hmm. was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And so it uh, seemed uh, entirely natural for me to want to uh, go into the Air Force. Now this, uh, the these programs were uh, at Hamilton? Uh, <clears throat> the, the program was conducted out of uh, the old Marcy Airport near Utica. Okay. Um, so uh, not far from Hamilton, maybe maybe a 10 mile drive from Hamilton. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. what, uh, what was that program like? You got some flying time? And got some flying time and uh, s did some soloing and got my uh, my private pilot's license, mm. and, uh, and it was very enjoyable. Oh, good. In the uh, second program with the Waco F-7, we got into um, combat maneuvers mm -hmm. like shondells and immobile turns mm -hmm. and slow rolls and snap rolls and uh, spins and, and all that, and uh, um, I, the, the whole uh, acrobatics program. Sort of. Now, were the instructors uh, World War One aviators, or I believe my instructor in the second program, the Waco F-7 program, had been a World War One aviator. Mm -hmm. I'm a little bit unsure of That's that. Okay. I believe he had. Been. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
How did those planes handle? Well, as I recall, and, and as I compare it with how some of the later planes handled that I worked with, they, they handled very easily. Mm -hmm. I uh, don't recall having any, any particular difficulty with it. Now, um, after you graduated from these programs, where did you go? Uh, well, I, I finished the um, second CPT program mm -hmm. while a senior at Hamilton. I believe I finished the, the first term of my senior year. Mm -hmm. So uh, I enlisted in the aviation cadet program in July of 1942 at Syracuse, New York. Mm -hmm. And then I was not called into active service until January of 43, January 6 of 43. What was that program supposed to be doing? What did that train you to do, the cadet program? <clears throat> well, the cadet program uh, uh, trained us, that is me and thousands and thousands of others, to be either a, a pilot or a navigator or a bombardier. Mm -hmm. And uh, I uh, went in uh, originally into the pilot training program maybe getting a little bit ahead of the story here, but uh, I became a bombardier mm -hmm. in, the, in the upshot. Was it a pretty good training program? Well, as nearly as I could judge, uh, mm -hmm. I, I would say yes. It was, a, it, it was a rough program. I, I did very well, I thought, during the uh, primary part of the training program at uh, Stamford, Texas, where we flew um, Fairchild, I believe, mm -hmm. Fairchild, can't remember the number designating it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I had no, uh, no particular problem there. And then I got into the secondary, which the Air Force called the basic training program uh, in Enid, Oklahoma. And the uh, BT-15, I believe the airplane was, what we call it the Vaulty Vibrator, <laughs> was, uh, it was a transition that uh, I wasn't successful in making. It, mm -hmm. was, a, it was a bigger airplane and I, I never felt comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. So I didn't get very far into that program when the powers that be decided that I would do better in the bombardier training program than in the pilot training. Now, where did you go for the bombardier training? Uh, for the, well, uh, <coughs> for the bombardier training program, I eventually wound up at uh, Deming, New Mexico. Uh -huh. But before that, after having been in the pilot training program uh -huh. through the primary phase at Stamford, Texas, and the basic uh, phase to the extent that I did uh, get through it in Enid, Oklahoma, I uh, went to uh, San Antonio, Texas for the summer of 19... 43 it would be, and just uh, uh, awaited redeployment. And from there we were sent to a gunnery school at Kingman, Arizona. Oh. Uh, this was the fall of 1943. And from uh, after gunnery school, which as I recall was about a nine week program, we were uh, sent to Deming, New Mexico for a bombardier training. What was, uh, did you enjoy gunnery? Very, very much, that, that, was, that was fun, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, the bombardier program, um, the training pretty good? Um, to the extent that I could judge, I, I would say the training was excellent. Um, beginning with, uh, um, working with the, were called the bomb trainers, mm -hmm. uh, simulated mm -hmm. uh, bombing uh, on the ground, and and then uh, a lot of practice bombing in the air, mm -hmm. both day and night. Oh. It was a good program. So, what was it like on the night flights? Well, it's a little hard to get used to. <clears throat> uh, 
uh, other than that, I, I didn't have any problem. Mm -hmm. Any uh, any experiences stand out in your mind during training? Well, I guess the, the, the one thing that stands out in my mind is that the, the very first bomb I dropped was, was the best one that I ever dropped. <laughs> I, I, uh, I think uh, by more luck than skill, I hit a bullseye. Oh, really? <laughs> my, my, my instructor who was riding with me was... I don't think he knew whether to smile or fade away, but he was taken aback. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, that stands out in my mind. Mm -hmm. That would have been a good time to retire in terms of training. <laughs> I was ahead of the game. Mm -hmm. And uh, once you got out of this program, where were you assigned? I was assigned to... Uh, Salt Lake City mm -hmm. for for just a few days for reassignment okay. and and then from there to combat crew training in Ardmore, Oklahoma, where we were introduced to the B-17s and 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 met the other members of our crew and uh, did uh, combat training. What was your initial impression of the B-17? <clears throat> well, uh, of course. Uh, uh, by the standard of any airplane I'd had anything to do with, it was huge. <laughs> Seems strange now, of course, but it was uh, it was our he front line heavy bomber at the time, and uh, I've, I've always, from from day one, had great affection for the B-17, having it brought me home. Yeah. The um, what was it like meeting the rest of the crew? Uh, Pretty good group of guys, generally. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I think there's uh, unhappily some uh, friction, some clash of personalities between the pilot and co-pilot, which uh, you know it, it didn't make it a perfect crew by any mm -hmm. means. But we, on, on the whole, we got along well. Well, that's good. Yeah. So you started training together? We trained for nine weeks at Ardmore, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. You had pretty good confidence in the pilot and co-pilot? Uh, no more than fair, I would say. Okay. I, yeah. And um, after your nine weeks training together, where, where did you go? We received our orders for no, getting ahead of myself. We were transferred to uh, Kearney, Nebraska for a matter of a week or so, as far as I can recall. And from there, we received our order, our overseas uh, assignment. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were assigned to the 8th Air Force in England. And uh, from, from Kearney, we went by troop train to New York City, and from New York City by uh, C-54, we're flown to uh, uh, England and to our uh, Air Force base over there. What was your impression of England? Well, at the time, it was a pretty, uh, pretty drab place. I uh, had a very favorable impression of the of the English countryside, as you could see it from the air, very, very much like a big garden. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Where were you stationed? Initially? St stationed, uh, well, very, very initially, we were for a time uh, just outside London at Hampstead Heath, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. But that was only for a few days, and, and then we were transferred to our uh, permanent base at Kim Bolton. Okay. which is a little town near Bedford. I'm not sure whether to call it in the Midlands or in East, a East Anglia, kind mm -hmm. of in between the two, actually. And that's where you got your, uh, your, your plane? Uh, yes. 
Now, um, you're assigned to the 8th Air Force. 379th Group, 525th Squadron. And you did a few training missions prior to your first combat mission? Uh, yes. Uh, I believe we got to the base uh, in early or middle June, maybe, of that year, and uh, didn't go on combat operations until, uh, the, I think, the 12th of July was my first combat mission. So you, you shook the plane down and got the... Uh, well, we, uh, we did, uh, did some practice bombing missions. Mm -hmm. So as a bombardier, what in flight, what are your duties? Well, I, chiefly to uh, see that the bomb site is uh, uh, set up and, and ready to go mm -hmm. when, when you reach the, what we call the initial point. Mm -hmm. where, the, where the pilot says it's all yours and from that point, from there to the target, the airplane is flown essentially through the working of the bomb site. Now, did every B-17 didn't have a bomb site though, did they? Uh, that is true. Now, I don't, I don't know how many of them did not carry bomb sites. But yours did? Uh, Mine always did, even though I may not have been uh, using the bomb site myself. Okay. So I should say that the the person who the bombardier who had uh, prime responsibility for the uh, operation of the bomb site was the bombardier in the lead airplane. This this would have been the uh, the airplane leading the, either the 12 plane squadron, mm -hmm. 12 to 15 plane squadron, or the uh, 36 to 40 plane group. Mm -hmm. Now, where was your. Tell us about your first combat mission. First combat mission was to Munich. It was a long, quite a long flight. Uh, we were awakened at uh, a quarter of one that morning. Sergeant, Sergeant said, uh, uh, breakfast at 1.15, briefing at 2 or something like that. And uh, I don't know what time we uh, took off, probably 5 o'clock or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, was, uh, it was a mission I remember because we encountered heavy flak over, really? the, over the target. What was that, what was uh, that like? Uh, I don't know how to how to describe it other than suddenly being aware that uh, there's suddenly a, a black puff just outside my window with a with a red center in it, mm. and, and then I hear a a uh, something rattling against the plane. Well, this is the pieces of flak. Mm -hmm. person against the plane, mm -hmm. and uh, it unnerving. A little bit unnerving. I didn't realize how heavy the flak had been till I. This was my first mission, mm -hmm. so I wasn't sure whether this was uh, normal or a little uh, heavier than normal. But the the fellows back at the base after the mission said it was. Uh, Unusually heavy flak. So that was your first got mission. A good, good baptism. <laughs> yes. Was it a successful mission? Uh, as far as I know. Yeah. Okay. This, this is something we never. Uh, I won't say never, but uh, more often than not, didn't know how successful the mission was. I it's guess any mission you get back is a fairly well, successful. Well, yeah, you can say if you can walk away from it, it's successful. Yeah. Um, so that was your first and, mission. And many, many of the missions we couldn't see the target. So the, uh, uh, the, the lead bombardier would be using uh, uh, what we call pathfinder equipment, radar equipment, mm -hmm. to 
enable him to bomb through the cloud cover. Okay. So that, that's why I say it's hard to say what was successful. Right. Um, were you supported with by fighters in uh, these missions? Uh, yes. By the time I joined the uh, 8th Air Force in June of uh, 43, uh, 44, we're in 44 now. Uh, by that time, um, we had uh, long range P 51s, the Mustangs, mm -hmm. and they could accompany us all the way to the target. Mm -hmm. So we uh, almost always had fighter escort. Now, did, uh, did the bombardier have any gunnery responsibilities? Yes. The bombardier in the, what series was it, the B-17G, where they had uh, had um, installed the, the chin turrets, the uh -huh. 250 caliber machine guns for the bombardier to uh, operate. Okay. So uh, the bombardier is responsible for that. And you got to operate? Yes. Uh, did you see not, much? Not, not very often. I think in my in my thirty missions, uh, I th I would say we didn't have more than five uh, serious encounters with fighters. Oh, really? So I got to do some shooting of the guns, but uh, not a great deal. Okay. Uh, your your particular plane was it named? Did it have any nose art? <coughs> And the, uh, the first airplane we had, uh, my, my navigator, I think, uh, lettered on it, Alive in 45, which is a hope as much as anything right. else. Yeah. <coughs> uh, but um, <coughs> contrary to uh, what you often see in the movies, uh, we didn't get particularly attached to uh, one airplane. Oh, really? We'd, be assigned to uh, to another airplane sometimes, mm -hmm. depending on uh, uh, on the uh, ground crews and whether they had you know the airplane ready to go. Uh, and I should say too that after after eleven missions with my original crew, I was. Uh, uh, in the expression they use, I was stood down for training as a lead bombardier. And af after my first 11 missions, I, I flew with, uh, well, just a random uh, assortment of airplanes. So, mm -hmm. uh, whoever was uh, flying the lead of the squadron or the group is the one I flew with. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you, you ended up a, a lead bombardier? Yes. That's quite a bit of responsibility. Well, <coughs> yeah, as, as we were saying earlier, he, he's the one who, who really uses the bomb sight. The, other, the others hit the toggle switch when his bombs drop. So. Now, is this the Norden bomb sight? It was the Norden bomb sight. Uh, what, any special precautions, uh, security precautions? I don't really think so, not as far as I can remember. By that time, uh, so many B-17s had gone down that the, the Germans knew all about the, mm -hmm. the Norden bomb site, I'm sure. Okay. Um, so was there extra pressure being the lead bombardier? Oh, yes. Yeah. You must have Because everything was on you, really. I mean, that was the whole point of the whole mission. So, yeah, it felt felt the responsibility. Mm -hmm. So you flew with a variety of crews? Uh, yes. Any uh, mission out of the 30, any mission or mission stand out other than the first one? Well, I, I remember things about them, about uh, several. Uh, that stand out a little more than others. I'm over Leipzig. The uh, I remember the uh, uh, the attacks of the German fighters uh, more vividly, maybe than than some others, because mm -hmm. I can I still see those uh, 
ME-109s flying wing to wing and coming right at us, and I'm saying to myself, gee, they're, they're blowing smoke rings. <laughs> you know, they, the cannons were firing, and I see the smoke rings come out. And, and, uh, so they came, they came in as pair, a pair? They came in wingtip to wing, wingtip. Oh. But they had, they had different maneuvers that I don't really, uh, you know, I'm not familiar with. Right. And, uh, but I remember the ME-109s coming in wing to wing, and I remember the FW-190 shooting through our formation so, so close I could see the German pilots. Really? Face, you know. So they're vivid memories. Did yeah. you see any of the 262s, the jets? Uh, on, on one of my uh, very last missions, I saw one in the distance. Mm -hmm. That must have been impressive. Well, it was, uh, for me, unprecedented. It's the only time I ever saw one. Right. Yeah. Right. Um. So the, uh, you did 30 missions all told? 30 missions, yes. Uh, that was uh, the standard at the time was 35, but uh, since I'd flown lead on 19 missions, uh, they <laughs> let me go after 30. Oh, they did. Yeah. So, um, how does it feel when you start getting up to like mission 28, mission 29, and you know that there is going to be an end to this? One way or another. One way or another. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I don't know, except to say it's a, it's a mixture, it was a mixture of hope and dread. Yeah. Uh, now, did you know that uh, the 30th was going to be your last mission? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's so, where that, yeah. So you were probably so I, pretty apprehensive that whole mission? Uh, well, it was, uh, it was a... Uh, it was a short mission, not what we call a deep penetration, I think. Mm -hmm. It was just to the Ruhr Valley, Gelsenkirchen, as I recall. And uh, I, I was apprehensive, but not as apprehensive as if I'd had to go into uh, as far as Berlin or Munich or mm -hmm. Pinamundi or someplace like that. And so once uh, so was, the like, bombs dropped and you're turning to go home, uh, waiting to see the White Cliffs of Dover. <laughs> yeah. They they had special meaning that trip. Uh, they did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, after your thirtieth mission, what happens to you? Uh, well, I I uh, I don't remember. I probably waited a few days to be. To be moved to uh, Swansea, Wales, where mm -hmm. where uh, I got the Santa Rosa. Came home on the ship, the Santa Rosa. I oh. was on on the Santa Rosa at uh, Christmas time, mm -hmm. 1944, time of the Battle of the Bulge, which yeah. was big news. Then. And arrived back in Boston Harbor uh, just before New Year's of 1940. Where are we now? 45, I guess, yeah. yeah. So what was it like coming into Boston Harbor? Cold. <laughs> Cold, yeah. Cold. But I'm sure yeah. you're happy to see it. Uh, yeah. It was, they gave us a steak dinner, and uh, it was great. Great to be home again. Yeah. Was there a parade or anything? No, yeah. no, no. Just you got your no. steak dinner. Yeah. yeah. And then we were transferred, I think, to Camp Atterbury, Indiana, for a few days, and mm -hmm. from there, uh, sent home on leave for I don't remember how long, 10 days or thereabouts. So, it's your first time home in quite a while. Uh, I hadn't been home. Well, I'd been home briefly, actually a little less than a year before. Oh, so okay. I graduated from Bombardier School in uh, February of 44. And I was home for a, a few okay. days at, at that time. And then, of course, at Ardmore, as I've told you, in combat and so on, and got home within a year. So uh, I, I had it a lot easier than some of the guys. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
but tougher than others. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, where, where were you discharged? I was discharged, uh, well, ultimately from Fort Dix, New Jersey. But before that, uh, <coughs> I, uh, I was assigned to, uh, well, there was a kind of a vacation redeployment assignment to Miami Beach for a few days. And then, uh, <coughs> then I was assigned to uh, Midland, uh, Texas for Bombardier Instruction School, oh, okay. actually. And from there to Childress, Texas for redeployment. And from Childress, Texas, I was uh, mustered out to Fort Dix. And, uh, so what did you do when you get home? Uh, I planned uh, my future. Uh, I had uh, I got home in October of 45, and I applied to graduate school at Syracuse University and started my master's program there in uh, January of uh, 46. You took advantage of the GI Bill? Yeah. Okay. Right. And after you graduated, what did you do? I uh, applied for a position on the faculty at Utica College and uh, was lucky. There's a, there's a big need for faculty at that time mm -hmm. because of the uh, GI Bill and all the right. GIs coming, coming back to school. So I uh, started as a uh, just uh, interim one-term uh, teacher at Utica College, but uh, after one term I became a permanent member of the faculty and I was there for almost 20 years. Wow. What, uh, Subjects? Political science. Political science. Yeah. Okay. How, would, uh, how, do you, how would you summarize your military experience? Well, I suppose it's kind of a cliche. I, I'm awfully glad I had it, but I just assume not repeat it. <laughs> well, I tell you what, that's a, that's a pretty common... Yeah, that's right. But that's, that's okay. That's no, right. that's no, I, I had, uh, I, I suppose I had, uh, well, in some ways, from all I've heard, uh, maybe, a, maybe on the whole a better experience than, than some of my colleagues had. Mm -hmm. I always thought highly of most of the officers I had. Mm -hmm. very highly of some of them. I remember some of them with both admiration and affection. Mm -hmm. So f for the most part they were a good group of guys? Yes, outstanding. Although your first crew, that was a little... Yeah. Um, any uh, other experiences you can remember that you'd like to relate? Anything particularly funny, humorous? Mm, I'm afraid I'm a blank on that. That's okay. Mm. Well, we'd like to thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, that was that wasn't okay. too bad. Not at all. I, <laughs> sorry, I didn't have anything more dramatic to no, pass yeah. along to you. Th no. That's all right. That no. your experience is basically one which a lot of people have. Sure. You know, the, we survived. You survived. It was you did your job. Mm -hmm. yeah. You had a job. You did it. Often it wasn't dramatic. That's right. Uh, to survive 30 well, there, there were dramatic moments along the way, sure. of, course. Yeah, of course. To survive 30 missions, uh, that's, yep. that's particularly as lead bombardier, right? You're, uh, you're right out there. One of the things I remember, 
one of the things I remember is trying, <laughs> vividly is trying to, one, one of our bombs had hung up oh, and, and hadn't dropped when it should have. There, I, there I was over the North Sea trying to kick it down. Kick, kick it <laughs> I'm sure that was a... I guess I, had a... I guess I had at that moment a portable ox... I don't remember for sure. I had mm -hmm. a portable ox oxygen on and somehow it had come loose. So I was, I see, I, as I remember, I was on the verge of passing out oh, and dear. kicking at that bomb. <laughs> luckily, luckily the bomb dropped before I passed out anyway. Oh, so... <laughs> now we have a little bit of paperwork, sir. Okay.